All right. Well, good morning. We're going to get started in just about five minutes. If you don't mind opening up your chat box, saying hello, where you're logging in from, really excited to uh, get this session started in just about five minutes. Uh, I see Claris is here, Yui, Joy, Ashley. Excellent. Really appreciate you all joining and we'll see you soon. All right, if you have not done so already and you're just joining, welcome. Thanks so much for logging a few minutes early. Uh, if you don't mind going ahead and saying hello in the chat box where you are logging in from. See, we have an international audience today, super pumped.
All right, everyone. Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're logging in from. Very excited to get this webinar started. I really appreciate you all joining me. Welcome to this webinar where we will be talking about how to approach labs on the USMLE. And what I'm going to be doing is taking the normal lab value sheet that you get on an NBME or that pops out of your question bank, and I'm going to be breaking it down uh, with you step by step. So this is our very first Step 2 CK live webinar. I am so happy you are here and many more to come as this new year for me in particular is all about Step 2 CK and also developing Step 1 con uh, content as well. If this is your first time logging in to one of my webinars, I welcome you. I do want to introduce myself. My name is Rahul. I'm a practicing pediatric critical care physician. I'm also pursuing my master's in medical education. And over the past seven years, I have been absolutely passionate about helping students just like you excel on the step one shelf exams, as well as step two CK. There's my email. If you ever need to reach out, happy to uh, connect with you. I do want to spend just a little bit of time as to what makes HiGuru so unique for step two CK preparation. Overall, HiGuru is a holistic, strategic, and active learning approach to the USMLE. Similar to my step one content, my step two CK content is all about active recall. And we're gonna be breaking down many vignettes today. I also like to integrate concepts amongst organ systems. So today, when we talk about electrolyte abnormalities, I'm also going to be incorporating cardio and neuro, neuro concepts. I also am very passionate about teaching you high fidelity test taking techniques. And that's why I have devised courses to really give you a strategic approach to studying as well as approaching questions. And then finally, I think that you can uh, definitely agree with me that Step 2 CK shelf studying, it is a mental grind. And my goal is to make sure I optimize your performance and I focus on test taking psychology because when you're positive, you'll be able to study a little bit more productively. All in all, my goal is to make sure that you think like the test maker. And that's why I focus on this triad when I work with students. Number one, content integration. And for Step 2 CK in particular, I focus on clinical reasoning. I also like to make sure that you are accountable and I leverage a very powerful platform that you've already uh, probably been familiar with called Notion and creating high fidelity study schedules so that you are able to get productive and be productive throughout your dedicated study as well as your shelf preparation. And then finally, it is all about being positive and having balance and wellness. And that's why I like to focus on test taking psychology because on game day at the ProMetric, you're gonna have to not only physically be there, not only intellectually need to be there, but mentally and emotionally, you have to be uh, uh, there and optimized. I think most importantly, and this is amazing how we have over uh, 80 people joining us today, Hi Guru is a lifelong, uh, a community, excuse me, of lifelong learners. And I'm so glad that you are here today with me. I have been humbled to work with many students. Here's just a glimpse of some of the students that I've been able to uh, work with. And I am very proud of each and every one of you for taking the next step and joining me today. So I do want to start out by highlighting how step two CK is a little bit different than step one. When we think about the question types related to step one versus step two CK, step one is really mechanism oriented. And what step one forces you to do is take a mechanism of disease and pair it sometimes with the diagnosis. Step one also wants you to know the underlying etiology that kind of triggers off the whole pathophysiology of disease. Step two CK being a little bit more clinical they focus on diagnosis, management, and then underlying risk factors, which can contribute to the diagnosis or which need to be modified in order to optimally manage a patient. What I will say is that the way that I'm going to be teaching Step 2CK is that it's going to be a 
build on step one. I don't like to think about them separately. In fact, I like to think about them a little bit more complementary or one building on top of each other. So you will frequently see me today and in future webinars relating back step one content, because I do believe that if you are going to do well on step two CK, you should have a strong basic science foundation. And both of these combined will also help you with step three. As I mentioned, step two CK is all about what is the likely diagnosis, what is the etiology or underlying risk factor, and in particular, what is the next best step in management? One of the key test-taking strategies that I want to give you is that any time in a step two CK UWorld question or NBME vignette, you always want to take a symptom and highlight or understand the pathophysiology of why that symptom is happening. Because if you get good at the pathophysiology behind symptoms, the next best step is just about, is just about reversing the pathophysiology. And I'm going to go through that model with a specific example, but I want you to recognize that symptom to pathophysiology is so important to do well on these questions. So say, for example, you are going to have a patient who comes in with shortness of breath, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and physical exam showing crackles. Well, these are all symptoms of heart failure. And what is happening is that in the alveoli, you are getting fluid, transudative fluid that is backing up as the left ventricle is failing, LV backs up into the LA, backs up into the pulmonary veins and into the capillary. And all that extra fluid extravasates into the alveoli, giving you shortness of breath, giving you the inability to lay flat and crackles. Because remember, crackles on a vignette question represents fluid or fibrosis. So that's why when it comes to next best step in management, it may be, hey, get an echo. Why? Because the underlying etiology is LV failure. Or that's why next best step in management is diuretics, because you want to get rid of that fluid that is in the alveoli or the elevated pulmonary venous congestion. As a build on this, I want you all to recognize that when it comes to getting good at what is the likely diagnosis questions? You want to think about diagnoses as vocab words. And vocab words always have a definition. And what is the definition of a diagnosis? Well, it is a vocab word that is tied to an underlying mechanism of disease. So let's go through this. Here, I have an infectious trigger that caused a humoral antibody response that then led to autoimmune destruction of Schwann, Schwann cells and then subsequently axonal degeneration of peripheral motor and sensory fibers. Can you put it to the chat? What is the diagnosis based on this mechanism of disease? I.e., give me the vocab word. Go ahead and put that into the chat. Excellent. Many of you are saying Guillain-Barre syndrome and you're absolutely correct. So Guillain-Barre syndrome is a vocab word, and here's the underlying mechanism of disease. But I'm going to take it even further, and I'm going to say, hey, step two CK, your internal medicine shelf, it's all going to be about next best step in management as well. So if you think about it first, let's just understand the lab values that are going to be abnormal based on this mechanism of disease. Well, because there is a humoral antibody response, you are going to have elevated protein levels, and there is albuminocytologic dissociation. On top of that, when you're thinking about the axonal degeneration, nerve conduction studies are going to show decreased velocity. But let's think about next best step in management. Well, when we think about next best step in management, we want to get rid of the autoantibodies. So you can plasmapherese, take them out, or bind them up via IVIG. Another thing for us to note, based on the pathophysiology, ascending axonal degeneration. Well, that can affect the diaphragm. So one of our next best steps in management is going to be assessing the force vital capacity to see how the diaphragmatic uh, function is. 
With that in mind, we're going to pivot and go into NBME Labs. But are you all excited to continue and uh, get started with uh, our session today? Type in yes into the chat box. You guys learning something? Excellent. Tasha, Melanie, Farah, Nana, Riddhi. Excellent. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining and your energy. You know, honestly, I want you all to stay focused. So if you have, you know, your phone out or something like that, put it on do not disturb. Just give me 50 minutes of your attention today. And I promise you, it's going to help you not only now, but even clinically and on your exam. All right, here we go. So our session outline today is essentially going to be breaking down this lab sheet. Now, this lab sheet is, is a three-page document that the NBME puts out. And what we are going to cover today is the serum, i.e. page one of this uh, lab sheet. Now, our goal is to get a framework on how to approach labs in UWorld and NBME questions. And what I'm going to be doing to achieve that goal is integrating vignettes. And these are vignettes that you will see in on shelf exams as well as step two CK. This session, as you know, is all about labs. And when we think about the overall anatomy about uh, on how a vignette is written, and you can find this in more depth in my test taking strategies course, labs usually are going to come after the physical exam in a test question. And that's super important for us to recognize that labs come right after the physical exam. What you want to do is you want to, up until the labs, using the history and the physical, you want to create a working diagnosis, and then you want to lean into the labs. You don't want to just start with the labs and then try to figure out what's going on in the question. You want to paraphrase after every single period and try to figure out what is your working diagnosis so that then you can tailor what labs you want to look at first. And this helps you just become very time efficient uh, while you are taking uh, your blocks. As you know, the UWorld Step 2 CK questions are just so massive. So you want to create an efficient, systematic strategy. I did post about this on my Instagram yesterday, and I want to give you a stepwise approach, test-taking strategy on how to approach labs. The first thing that I like to say is I want you all to avoid going from top to bottom. Because what many students do is they, op they look at the labs, they open up the normals, and then they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, highlighting what's abnormal. Then they say, phew, now I can think about it. And then they start plugging in and they try to figure out what's going on after they have this like mindless, what's abnormal, what's not. In my opinion, you want to create a working diagnosis based on the history and physical on the, uh, in the vignette. And then go with your low-hanging fruit lab. So let's look at this. A 25-year-old uh, woman with heavy menstruation. Well, when you're thinking about heavy menstruation, you want to go with your low-hanging fruit because she's losing blood. So I would look at the hemoglobin first. So that's my low-hanging fruit in a whole list of labs. And then finally, what I want to do is then branch out from there. Well, if she's losing blood, most likely she is going to have a microcytic anemia. And after a hemoglobin, I'm going to look at the MCV and I'm going to categorize whether it's microcytic, normocytic, or macrocytic. So when we think about approaching laboratory values specifically on the USMLE and shelf exams, here is the overall uh, test taking strategy. Labs are going to be a quantitative data point that the USMLE is going to give you. What you want to do is you want to qualify that. Is it high? Is it low? Is it normal? Very simply, you just want to kind of figure out after you know what's your low-hanging fruit, you want to figure out high, low, normal. Pretty simple. But then the key here is trying to figure out what's the end organ dysfunction at hand. For example, if your creatinine is qualitatively high, you're going to say, oh, something's wrong with the kidney. It may seem simple, but again, it's just a systematic way so that then you don't get caught up when there are multiple lab abnormalities uh, at play or the history and physical is a little challenging for you. I'll give you a quick little example. So let's see, let's say you have ALT 144, AST 480. That's the quantitative. Can you qualify that in 
the uh, chat box, high, low, or normal? What do you think? Everybody's like, high. Yes, you're absolutely correct. It's going to be high. And so now you've qualified that as AST and ALT elevations. And you're like, oh, AST is just a little bit higher than ALT. What's important for us to do is now relate the end organ dysfunction. The patient has liver dysfunction. AST is slightly higher than ALT. And my working diagnosis based on even the social history is, oh man, the patient may have alcoholic hepatitis. You also want to understand the physiology behind the labs. And this is a concept that's a little bit more advanced that I'm going to be talking about more and more in step two CK webinars, but understanding the physiology behind labs is essential. Remember, AST is all about transamination and amino acid processing, whereas ALT, it's primarily involved in urea synthesis because alanine is one of the mediators and gluconeogenesis. Again, liver functions. So speaking of liver functions, I'm going to be breaking down the various functions of the liver, the lab abnormalities that you see, and then the vignettes. Are you guys following me? Go ahead and type in yes into the chat box. Awesome. Janice, Nana, Christina, Farah. Excellent. Thanks so much, guys. So the first thing that we're going to be looking at is the normal function of the liver, which is transamination. And how do we measure transamination? AST and ALT. It's basically handling nitrogen compounds from amino acids. And you get amino acids from where? Skeletal muscle breakdown, et cetera. The liver is also important in detoxification. And how do we measure that? Well, that's when we see questions where the ASD and ALT are super elevated in the thousands. So when it's in the thousands, you wanna be thinking about toxins. You wanna to be thinking about viral hepatitis. When it comes to toxins, you wanna to be thinking about Tylenol ingestion, for example. The liver is also important. Uh, 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 the liver is important for dealing with nitrogenous waste, like I told you. And in particular, it is the urea cycle, taking ammonia, which is going to be NH3, and converting it into urea. And remember that if a patient comes in with acute liver failure, and they have such bad liver dysfunction that they're unable to do urea, fun urea cycle, their ammonia is going to build up, it's going to cross the blood-brain barrier, and then they're going to have the flapping tremor known as asterixis. The liver is important in lipid metabolism. Key features for us to know for step two is the fact that the liver is going to be important in reverse transport of LDL, and it is important in synthesizing apolipoprotein B100 for VLDL synthesis. The liver is also important in regulating oncotic pressure. What major protein does the liver synthesize to regulate oncotic pressure? Go ahead and put that into the chat box. And I give these questions just so that you all are staying at the edge of your seat and paying attention. Excellent active recall there. So albumin is the major driver for oncotic pressure in the intravascular space. And so obviously, if you have decreased production of albumin due to liver dysfunction, you can get edema. The liver is also important in what we call the synthetic function, which is the coagulation factors, the activation of your vitamin K-dependent clotting factors, 2, 7, 9, 10, protein C and protein S. And what we use to measure that is the PT and the INR. And that's why whenever you have a patient on your vignette that has liver dysfunction, their PT and INR can be elevated, indicating that the liver is sick, it can't do vitamin K depending clotting factor activation, and in particular, your extrinsic clotting cascade is suffering. Finally, the liver is important for bilirubin metabolism. We use things like ALKFOS, total billy and direct billy. And this is all going to be related to the gallbladder tree, which we will be talking about soon. So in your vignettes, how do you suspect a patient has liver dysfunction? Well, you may recognize a trigger in the history, but also understand that these patients are going to have jaundice. And jaundice is just basically going to be that either the liver is sick or another advanced way to think about it, integrating heme, 
is that jaundice may be also due to hemolysis. And I'm going to make a big point of that upcoming. As you can see, the title of this slide is Basic Science Integration. And this goes back to this notion that if you are going to do well on step two CK, you got to understand the basic science as well. Remember that indirect bilirubin is going to be present as a byproduct of heme metabolism. And that indirect bilirubin is going to come on albumin to the liver. And the liver has the UDP glucuronal transferase that is going to take indirect bilirubin, turn it into direct bilirubin, and then is going to store some of that in the gallbladder tree. Any abnormality in this process, i.e. either decreased uptake or inefficiency of the hepatocyte can cause you to have elevations in indirect bilirubin. Any obstruction to the normal outflow after the bilirubin is conjugated can give you a direct hyperbilirubinemia. So let's kind of integrate this a little bit more. As you can see, we have the gallbladder tree here, and we have the gallbladder. The gallbladder is going to empty into the cystic duct and then into the common bile duct. And as you can see, the common hepatic duct plus the cystic duct gives you the common bile duct. And the common bile duct plugs in with the pancreatic duct into the pancreas via the ampulla of water. And the US assembly wants you to know that you can have stones that are going to be dislodged in various locations. And these stones are going to have different vocab words, so to say, based on where this, where the obstruction, i.e. where the stone is going to be in this anatomic model. So for example, if you're going to have stones that are just going to be in the gallbladder, that's going to be just known as cholelithiasis. If you have a patient who is going to have after a fatty meal, right shoulder pain, right upper quadrant pain that subsides sometime afterwards, that's going to be known as biliary colic. And remember the illness script for the uh, patients who are going to be in your vignettes may be the female fat 40. Also recognize that if that stone in the cystic duct is always going to be there and it's going to stay there, you can have inflammation that then ends up some, uh, uh, being uh, present in the gallbladder. And so I'm just drawing fire on the gallbladder because that means that the cystic duct is obstructed, there is backstream inflammation, and that's called cholecystitis. So we said cholelithiasis, biliary colic, cholecystitis. And then what is it called when you have a stone in the common bile duct? Well, that's called cholecystitis. And cholecystitis may have issues in the intra and extra hepatic ducts, as well as with the cystic ducts because it's in a common bile duct. And sometimes you can get infection of the gallbladder tree. And can you type into the chat, what is it called when you have infection of the gallbladder tree? What is that known as? Excellent. Many of you are saying cholangitis and you're absolutely correct. Now you can even have a stone that is gonna be lodged in the pancreatic duct, that's important for us to know because gallstones can cause pancreatitis because now the pancreatic duct cannot empty. And then finally, you could have a stone that is going to make its way from the gallbladder tree into the duodenum and into the ileum. And you can get something called gallstone ileus where the gallstone is at the terminal ileum and it causes such bad dilation of the uh, whole, or of the small intestine as well as the uh, uh, biliary tree, and that's called gallstone ileus. So now you recognize that whoa, it's a little bit of a vocabulary based on where the stone is going to be lodged. For acute ascending cholangitis, 
Always remember to look out for Charcot's triad in questions. Again, this model is helpful, but what's even more helpful is to think like the test maker. So fever, it'll be greater than 38 degrees in my vital signs. Jaundice, they may put that in the history. They may even put that in the exa uh, uh, physical exam. Right upper quadrant pain, that may be, again, in the history or in the physical exam. So you want to map these symptoms to what part of the vignette it's going to be. Then if you add with the fever, jaundice, right upper quadrant pain, confusion, and shock, that's the Raynaud's pentad. And again, this is all for acute ascending cholangitis. All right, here's our first question. A 25-year-old female presents with jaundice. She had a one-week history of cough and URI and was placed on azithromycin as her chest x-ray revealed interstitial infiltrates. Vital signs, afebrile, tachycardic, blood pressures, a little bit on the lower side. Hemoglobin is going to be low. Reticulocyte is 3.2%. Total bile is 2.8 with a direct of 0.4. Her Coombs is positive. Spherocytes are seen on smear. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, B, G6PD, C, hereditary spherocytosis, or D, acute cholecystitis? What do you all think is the best answer here? Excellent. I am seeing a lot of A's, and if you said A, you're absolutely correct. Let's go ahead and just quickly draw out the pathophysiology. The patient had a atypical pneumonia, probably due to mycoplasma pneumonia. The patient then ended up developing a lot of IgM, and that IgM can trigger you to have hemolysis of the RBC. And so what you want to think of here is the fact that this is a cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And remember, in cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia, due to a loss of the membrane, you could have spherocytes. And in particular, because you have RBCs that are going to be coated with IgM, you're going to have a positive Coombs test. And remember, positive Coombs really helps you diagnose autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Why I make a big deal about this is the fact that when you think about indirect hyperbilirubinemia, usually the indirect fraction is going to be greater than 20% of the total billy, i.e. majority of the total billy is going to be indirect in your questions. So when you see indirect hyperbilirubinemia, you are going to be thinking about two thought processes. Number one, decreased biliary clearance, or number two, increase bilirubin production. So decreased bilirubin clearance is going to be due to things such as Gilbert's disease. Think about an acute stressor like fasting and then an asymptomatic jaundice. Again, it's the hepatocyte not being able to uptake the bilirubin. Or Krigler Najjar type 1. This is a neonate who presents within the first 24 hours of uh, life with severe jaundice. And this is going to be a very severe indirect hyperbilirubinemia because you don't have the UDP glucuronyl transferase to conjugate the bilirubin. But it can also be due to increased bilirubin production. And that's why it maps back to that last question. And whenever you see an indirect hyperbilirubinemia, not only do you want to be thinking about liver causes, but you want to be thinking about the red blood cell and hemolysis. And in particular, you want to be thinking about a normocytic anemia. Again, normocytic anemia, how do you recognize it? Low hemoglobin, MCV 80 to 100. And then you can stratify the normocytic anemia based on where the hemolysis is occurring, intravascular in the blood vessel or extravascular in the spleen. But you always want to take the total bilirubin and figure out, is it majority indirect or is it majority direct? And that will help you stratify in your mind what you're dealing with. And our discussion right now was when the total bilirubin is primarily going to be indirect. Another gallbladder tree lab 
is going to be the ALK-FOS. So whenever you see alkaline phosphatase going to be elevated, you're going to be thinking about the gallbladder tree that is going to be messed up. But what you're also going to be thinking about is the bone being messed up, i.e. alkaline phosphatase can be elevated whenever there is bone turnover. And so what are some of the causes of elevated alkaline phosphatase due to bone turnover? Paget's disease. It could be physiologic, such as puberty. Think about an adolescent patient. Vitamin D deficiency. And bony metastasis. Think about the question of prostate cancer or breast cancer that metastasizes to the uh, vertebrae. When it comes to elevated ALK-FOS and the gallbladder tree, you're going to be thinking about, well, is the direct bilirubin just unable to get excreted out from the hepatocyte? Or is there a post-liver obstruction based on some of the areas we were talking about when we were talking about cholecystitis, cholelithiasis, et cetera, et cetera? In particular, you want to be thinking about, okay, is there an obstruction in the cystic duct or in the common bile duct? And what's the obstruction called in the common bile duct? Cholelithiasis. So I'm going to ask you this question. What lab value will help stratify ALK-FOS to say it's primarily a hepatic or biliary uh, tract uh, cause? What is that lab value that you want to also get with the ALK-FOS to stratify? Oh, it's the gallbladder tree, actually. And if you said GGT, you are absolutely correct. Very good. All right, let's go ahead and apply this concept. A 68-year-old male presents with increased ALK-FOS on routine laboratory evaluation. His past surgical history includes a cholecystectomy at age 50. Vital signs are normal. Physical exam shows decreased hearing bilaterally. Labs show ALK-FOS of 440, which is high, and a total bilirubin that is 1.2. What is the likely diagnosis? Go ahead and type that into the chat. What do you think? Excellent. If you said Paget's disease, you're absolutely correct. An asymptomatic elevation in ALKFOS in an elderly patient who also has decreased hearing bilaterally, indicating that the skull is kind of impinging on cranial nerve eight, you are going to be thinking about Paget's disease. So let's go ahead and summarize the gallbladder tree. You're going to be looking at lab values such as ALKFOS as well as GGT, indirect bilirubin, and direct bilirubin based on your total bilirubin. ALKFOS GGT, you're going to be thinking specifically for ALKFOS, you're going to be thinking about either bone or gallbladder tree. And remember, GGT is just a little bit more specific for the gallbladder tree. Indirect hyperbilirubinemia, you're going to be thinking about prehepatic causes, i.e., decreased uptake by the hepatocyte to conjugate it, an intrahepatic cause, say that you have cirrhosis so bad or krigler najar where you just have a reduced function or an absence of UDP glucuronyl transferase, or you're going to be thinking about hemolysis. So what about direct bilirubin elevations? Well, if your direct bilirubin is greater than 20% of your total bilirubin, you're going to be thinking about, okay, it's already done conjugating. Is there some sort of cholestasis, post-hepatic obstruction, i.e. in the gallbladder tree? Is this something like cholidocolithiasis? Or even in some cases of pancreatitis, you can see not only elevations in amylase and lipase, but if the pancreatitis was, say, due to a gallstone, you may be seeing elevations in direct bilirubin. All right. So that was the general test-taking strategy approach, and I did put in how to approach the LFTs. The rest of this webinar, we're going to be talking about the serum lab values. I'm going to have other webinars that talk about the blood, the cerebrospinal fluid, and urine, but I wanted to make sure I went stepwise and in short segments. Before we go into this next section, just want to get feedback from you all. Are you guys learning something? Yes, no, maybe so. Go ahead and type in yes into the chat box or excellent. Wonderful. 
You guys are doing awesome. Hang in there. I know this is some dense stuff, but we got it together. The way that I like to approach lab values clinically, as well as in particular for this discussion for the USMLE, is kind of breaking it down based on the renal function panel and then thinking about extremes. So what I do is I say, all right, sodium, what are the vignettes related to hyponatremia and what are the vignettes related to hypernatremia? What are the vignettes related to hypokalemia? What are the vignettes related to hyperkalemia? What are the vignettes related to hypoglycemia? And what are the vignettes related to hyperglycemia? That's how we're going to organize this, understanding the extremes. But we're also going to relate some end organ dysfunction. I mean, hey, you see elevations in BUN and creatinine, you're going to be thinking the kidney is going to be dysfunction, uh, uh, is going to have some dysfunction. I'm going to be going through a, a webinar covering IM nephro in the future, but I do want to hit you with a little bit of a test-taking strategy on how I approach abnormalities in BUN and creatinine for my shelf and step 2 CK. When I think about acute kidney injury, I always first look in the vignette, what's the trigger? Was it some sort of nephrotoxin like vancomycin that the patient got? Was it hypoperfusion to the kidney? Is it dehydration? Then what I'm going to do is, remember, that's my working diagnosis. I get to the labs, ah, BUN to creatinine ratio is the next thing I look at because if those are messed up, you know the kidney is messed up. So in particular, you're going to be thinking about a BUN to creatinine ratio of greater than 20, BUN to creatinine ratio 10 to 15 is to one, and BUN to creatinine ratio that's initially greater than 20 and then goes into 10 to 15 is to one. When the BUN to creatinine ratio is going to be greater than 20 to one, what is that known as? That's called pre-renal. And pre-renal means that you either have low intravascular volume, such as dehydration, or the kidney is just not seeing the blood flow, i.e. in congestive heart failure. In this scenario, what's very important for us to know is that pre-renal azotemia, you have low effective perfusion to the kidney. And the kidney in the collecting duct is going to upregulate aquaporins via secretion of ADH and end up bringing in more water and a semi-permeable substance known as BUN. And that's why your BUN goes very, very high relative to your creatinine. Now, when you're thinking about a ratio that is like 10 is 10 to 15 is to one, you're going to be thinking about intrarenal azotemia or intrarenal kidney injury. This is the actual tubules of the kidney got messed up. The nephron got messed up. And again, the, looking at the trigger is going to be very important. Maybe you have an amino glycoside. Maybe you have such bad hypovolemic shock that now you have a patient who has intrarenal kidney injury. And that is the illness script for acute tubular necrosis. Watch for the muddy brown cast. You can also get a allergic trigger, like let's say for uh, example, a penicillin. And now the patient has this BUN to creatinine ratio and is peeing in uh, eosinophils. And that's known as acute interstitial nephritis. You can also then have a kind of mixed picture where initially you have a BUN to creatinine ratio that is pre-renal, and then it goes into intrarenal. And this is probably going to be due to a blockage in the ureter, such as, for example, a kidney stone or something like posterior urethral valve, a bladder outlet obstruction. You can get overflow incontinence, but again, the key here is that on ultrasound, they'll say hydronephrosis when you have a bladder outlet obstruction, indicating that the ureters are going to be blocked essentially distally at the urethra, and there's a lot of back pressure causing uh, uh, pelvic uh, calocele dilation. In this situation, recognize that initially you're going to have a pre-renal type of state as the back pressure is forcing it in a lot of BUN into the aquaporins, but then it goes back to chapters one through three of pathoma, cell injury, death, and adaptations. Obviously, if the cellular stress is so much, i.e. there's way too much back pressure, well, then you'll go into an intrarenal picture. Let's go ahead and go through this question. 
a 55-year-old female is admitted to the hospital for a kidney stone. On hospital day two, she is noted to have decreased urine output. She has flank pain and chills. Temperature is 101 Fahrenheit. Heart rate is 110. Blood pressure is 140 over 80. Physical exam shows CVA tenderness, which is costovertebral angle tenderness. Take a look at her labs. Which of the following best explains the change in her symptoms? A, pilo, B, acute cystitis, C, FSGS, D, nephrolithiasis, or E, acute tubular necrosis? What do you think is the best answer? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Excellent. Many of you are saying A, and you are absolutely correct. Let's go ahead and think about the question breakdown. We note that this patient is going to have a kidney stone, and that kidney stone is now going to be a trigger for her to have fever, which means infection or inflammation, plus oliguria, plus CVA tenderness. All of this is going to uh, represent pyelonephritis, infection of the renal parenchyma. As you can see, the B1 to creatinine ratio is anywhere between 10 to 15 is to one, B1 to creatinine ratio. And in particular, I want to highlight two important features of a vignette when you're thinking, oh God, are the kidneys messed up? Anytime you see hypertension, you got to make sure you look at the kidney function. Anytime you are going to have oliguria or anuria, you want to be thinking about the kidney function. So I hope I'm making this very practical for you, but this is just how, I'm th how I think about vignettes so that then I'm a little bit more active rather than passive. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to be tackling this dude right here, bicarb. And this goes into acid base. Now I do have acid based videos on my YouTube channel, so definitely check them out. But let's go ahead and go through how I approach acid base questions for shelf and step 2CK. Whenever I think about abnormalities in bicarb, in particular low bicarb, you really want to be thinking about calculating the anion gap. The second thing is anytime you have abnormalities in bicarb, it could be pointing to an underlying metabolic alkalosis or acidosis. Let's go ahead and go through this question. A 40-year-old female presents with confusion. Her husband found her laying in her own urine. He noticed bleeding from her mouth as she bit her tongue. Vital signs are normal. Neurological exam shows patient is alert and oriented times two and sleepy. Let's take a look at her labs. Well, in this situation, you want to be thinking about, okay, this could be a seizure. Maybe my low-hanging fruit is sodium, or maybe my low-hanging fruit is glucose. But what you also note is that the bicarb is going to be low. Which of the following best explains the presumed acidosis? Go ahead and put in your answer into the chat box. Excellent. So this patient basically had a seizure and seizure is going to give you increased muscle contraction. And if you have increased muscle contraction, you could have skeletal muscle hypoxia that can then give you elevations in lactate. And remember that lactic acidosis is going to be a cause of anion gap metabolic acidosis. So anytime I see a low bicarb, I say, I need to calculate the anion gap, which is going to be 142 minus the quantity of chloride plus bicarb. The way that I think about it, it's the positives minus the negatives, chloride plus bicarb. And you are going to get an anion gap that is, I think, around 21 uh, or so, but definitely greater than 12, which is the normal anion gap. And so this is going to be lactic acidosis due to a generalized tonic-clonic seizure.
I'm going to be sprinkling in with our Step 2 CK webinars a lot of uh, test-taking tips. So I'm going to read this one to you. If you see a set of electrolytes on Step 2 CK, look at the bicarb. If it is low, you can presume a metabolic acidosis. We're going to build on that. But first, just think about this uh, uh, test-taking uh, tip. Just a little bit of active recall, you especially want to look at the bicarb if your history and physical is suggesting shock. Maybe the patient is going to have increased losses or on physical exam, cold, pale, clammy skin. What does a low bicarb likely represent? Well, it represents a metabolic acidosis potentially. What is the pathophysiology behind lactic acidosis, which is one of the most common causes of a metabolic acidosis? Well, it represents a shock state where you are switching from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. It also may be due to the fact that the mitochondria are paralyzed and you have decreased extraction at the tissue level. What is the formula for anion gap? Well, that's going to be your positives minus your negatives. Sodium minus the quantity chloride plus bicarb. And normal anion gap is about 8 to 12. How do I conceptualize anion gap? Well, remember, I said that it is your positives minus your negatives. And so the way that I think about a gap is that something is being added to the extracellular matrix. A substance is being added to the extracellular matrix such that you're getting a schism between your positives and your negatives. So what is that something? Well, it could be methanol. It could be uremia. It could be DKA. It could be some sort of toxic alcohols. It could be iron, isoniazid, lactic acidosis, which I made a big deal about. It could be aspirin. It could be carbon monoxide, amino glycosides, theophylline. Again, the point is, is that it's a substance besides lactic acidosis. It is a substance that is being added to the extracellular matrix, causing a gap between positives and negatives. So we talked about the anion gap metabolic acidosis causes with a particular emphasis on lactic acidosis, but you're not anion gap metabolic acidosis. The way you can think about that is that you're losing positives and negatives at a same ratio. So that's going to be due to hyperchloremia. You may be gaining sodium and chloride in the same quantity. It could mean that aldosterone is going to be low. Remember, just as a basic science correlate, the normal function of aldosterone is to bring in sodium and make you pee out potassium and hydrogen ions. If you don't have aldosterone, you are in your blood going to end up accumulating H+. And if you accumulate H+, you will get a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis due to, for example, adrenal insufficiency where there's no aldosterone. A metabolic acidosis can be due to a renal cause, such as renal tubular acidosis. We'll be covering that, but remember, there's proximal and distal. Remember, RTA is a cause of non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. And non-anion gap metabolic acidosis could also be due to GI losses, let's say for diarrhea. Remember, vomiting causes a metabolic alkalosis, whereas diarrhea causes a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. So the three things with the non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, just to compartmentalize things, is think about too much chloride, too little aldosterone, is it an issue with my kidney, or is it an issue with diarrhea? Just as a little bit of a space repetition, I did want to go through the high-yield vignettes related to anion gap metabolic acidosis. So as you can see, the high-yield vignettes are related to methanol, uremia, diabetic ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, and aspirin. What are the key features in methanol vignettes? Well, in the history, they're going to say, oh, the patient is drinking moonshine or, or some sort of uh, uh, toxic alcohol. Remember, methanol is going to be uh, processed into formic acid. And so they could have visual blurring because formic acid is toxic to the optic nerve. These patients may have a high osmolar gap. So if you look at their uh, serum osmolarity and you calculate the uh, osmolarity of the patient, you are going to have an elevated gap. Uremia could be due to a patient who, for example, 
is uh, having chronic kidney disease. Maybe they missed their dialysis and now they have uremic pericarditis. They may have a qualitative platelet dysfunction where they have petechiae. They may have fluid overload and an anion gap metabolic acidosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis, we'll talk about this in the uh, glycemic uh, control issues. Lactic acidosis, we've talked about. Remember cyanide toxicity because cyanide affects complex four of the electron transport chain, you can get an anion gap metabolic acidosis, and that is due to mitochondrial paralysis. Typically, these patients in your test questions are going to be in a house fire. And then finally, you have aspirin, and aspirin is a really important one because you're going to hear that the patient may have ingested aspirin due to a suicide attempt. They may have ear ringing because aspirin is toxic to the uh, uh, cranial nerve eight. Aspirin is going to cause you to have hyperventilation. So in the vital signs, you'll have elevated respiratory rate. And remember, aspirin very characteristically will give you a mixed respiratory alkalosis and an anion gap metabolic acidosis. And because it's like acidosis alkalosis in your vignette in the labs, you may get a normal pH on your blood gas. So building on our test taking tip, if you see a set of electrolytes on step two CK, yes, look at the bicarb. And if the bicarb is low, you can presume a metabolic acidosis. But if you see a metabolic acidosis, you're going to calculate the anion gap. And honestly, if you're an all-star and they give you a whole ABG, you want to also calculate Winter's formula. And that's going to be something very important for you to uh, recognize and understand. All right, let's go through this question. A 32-year-old male presents with a four-day history of diarrhea due to inflammatory bowel disease flare. In the emergency department, he received 4,000 milliliters of normal saline for resuscitation. Heart rate and capillary refill have improved. One day after admission, you notice following lab abnormalities. What is the likely cause of his laboratory findings? What do you think is the diagnosis in this situation? I love that. Kieran Mai is saying not anion gap metabolic acidosis. I love how you calculated that. Beautiful. Good. Excellent. Many people are saying not anion gap metabolic acidosis. And the cause is going to be hyperchloremia. In this situation, the patient got excessive amounts of sodium chloride that caused you to have a elevation in your chloride. And you can think of it as they were getting sodium chloride in equal quantities. So your anion gap, if you do the quick uh, calculation, is going to be anywhere between eight to 12. So it is a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. The other thing for us to note as a basic science correlate is that bicarb and chloride are always opposites. And this is because there are certain cells like the intercalated cells in the distal collecting duct and in the proximal convoluted tubule that are going to kind of exchange in the sense that if chloride is very elevated in the blood, then bicarb is going to be low in the blood. If bicarb is very elevated in the blood, at times chloride is going to be low. So I like to think about chloride and bicarb as opposites due to the uh, uh, regulation from the kidney. All right. So we kind of covered chloride. We covered bicarb. We covered a little bit of the BUN and creatinine. Now we are going to go to the big kahuna, which is going to be sodium abnormalities. Are you guys learning something? Go ahead and type in yes in the chat box. You guys doing okay? Awesome. Y'all are doing wonderful. And thanks so much for your uh, participation. Okay. Excellent. Let's go ahead and talk about sodium abnormalities. And when it comes to sodium abnormalities, nephrologists will tell you it's not a sodium problem. It's actually a free water problem. And this concept actually helps you for step two CK. Let's go ahead and start with this warm up question. A 58 year old male presents with shortness of breath. He is unable to lie flat at night. Past medical history of hypertension and diabetes. Meds include lisinopril. Social history of 30-pack year smoking. He is hypertensive. 
Physical exam is notable for crackles and bilateral lung fields and two plus pitting edema in the extremities. Here are his labs. What is the likely etiology of his hyponatremia? What do you think is the best answer? A, diuretic use, B, pulmonary malignancy, C, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, D, acute kidney injury, or E, SIADH? This is such a unique one. And the answer that encompasses the most amount of data points is going to be C. The patient has hypervolemic hyponatremia secondary to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Let's go ahead and go into this concept a little bit more. When you see a sodium disorder on the step two CK, look at the physical exam and characterize the patient's volume status. Are they hypervolemic? hypovolemic or dehydrated looking, or euvolemic, normal volume status. Our last patient was hypervolemic. So here's the construct. Hyponatremia, you want to be looking in the physical exam of the vignette and categorize, is the patient hypervolemic, hypovolemic, or euvolemic? When you're thinking about hypervolemic hyponatremia, think about things that causes a fluid overload on the body. So the heart is backing up, i.e. congestive heart failure. Liver cirrhosis. Remember, in liver cirrhosis, you have decreased oncotic pressure and you can have edema. You have extravascular uh, uh, fluid that is going to elevate your total body water. Hypervolemic hyponatremia could also be due to nephrotic syndrome. Similar concept, but in this situation, you're peeing out albumin. What are causes of hypovolemic hyponatremia? Well, dehydration. And this is where you're losing a lot more salt and water. And so what's high yield for us to know is this is like the, uh, uh, how Gatorade was mean, right? It was that electrolyte solution that kind of helped you replace both water as well as salt. Another cause of hypovolemic hyponatremia, diuretics. Remember, diuretics are going to block, in the case of loop diuretics, the sodium-potassium two-chloride transporter at the ascending loop of Henle. Or thiazides are going to uh, block the sodium-chloride symporter in the distal convoluted tubule. And then you have hypovolemic hyponatremia due to adrenal insufficiency. And remember, aldosterone does three things. Brings in sodium, makes you pee out potassium and hydrogen ions. We talked about the fact that if you have adrenal insufficiency, it can give you a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, but you can also have salt wasting. And this could be due to something like congenital adrenal hyperplasia for your peed shelf, or it could be due to an autoimmune adrenalitis where a patient on your vignette is going to have an autoimmune stigmata, lupus, type 1 diabetes, hypothyroidism, and now is going to present with hyponatremia due to a lack of adrenal cortical function. Euvolemic hyponatremia, I think about ADH abnormalities. So things such as SIADH, where you have too many aquaporins that are going to be inserting in the distal collecting duct, and way too many aquaporins means way too much free water that comes in. But remember, that's going to be balanced by what hormone? ANP. ANP is going to help you pee out the extra amount of water. But remember, your serum sodium is still going to be low. So euvolemic hyponatremia, think about SIADH and what lung tumor can give you SIADH. Go ahead and put that in the chat. What lung tumor can give you SIADH? What do you think? If you said small cell lung cancer, you're right on. Very good. And then you are going to have psychogenic polydipsia. This is a schizophrenic patient who is just going to drink excess amount of water. And if they drink excess amount of water, same concept, excess free water, that's going to dilute down your intravascular space and you're going to get hyponatremia. Let's go ahead and go through this question. Three-month-old male presents with altered mental status and decreased responsiveness. The mother was noted to have little prenatal care. Mother states he has been formula feeding. The patient has a twin sibling who is healthy. 
In the emergency department, the patient has generalized tonic-clonic shaking of its extremities. Vital signs, the patient is afebrile. Physical exam shows diffuse hypotonia. Serum sodium is very low. Which of the following is the most likely cause of the hyponatremia? Now, this is a pretty tough question. And here you have a small baby that is going to be formula fed and is going to have seizures due to hyponatremia. And this could be due to excess amount of free water because of improper formula mixing. And again, the concept here is that babies who are going to be less than six months are going to have immature kidneys. They won't be able to handle excess amounts of free water. And thus, they are going to be prone to hyponatremia. So the concept here is that if you improperly mix formula where you're using way too much water compared to formula, babies can get hyponatremic. Another thing that I like to do when I talk about the extremes of the electrolytes is to think about the extreme symptoms they can present with. Sodium disorders, as you can see, present with central nervous system dysfunction, confusion, dizziness, irritability, focal neurological deficits, seizures, okay? And the reason why is a nice basic science integration. And that is that, remember, sodium is so important for the depolarization of your neuronal action potentials, such that if you have sodium abnormalities, you have abnormal action potentials in your CNS as well as peripherally. Let's go ahead and go through this vignette. A 15-year-old female presents to the PICU after a severe motor vehicle accident where she suffered a traumatic brain injury. On hospital day two, she is noted to have a urine output that is greater than five mLs per kilo per hour. Her vital signs are going to be normal. She has normal capillary refill and moist mucous membranes. I'm going to pause right here. Euvolemic, hypovolemic, or hypervolemic. What do you think is the best answer right now? You, hypo, or hypervolemic? Excellent. Riddhi, Melanie, Tasha, very proud of everybody who said you, Valimic, and are, is participating. You got it. So the patient has elevated urine output, euvolemia, and now look at her neuro exam. It's pretty poor. Fixed, non reactive pupils bilaterally. The serum sodium is going to be very elevated. What is the likely cause of her lab findings? What do you think is the diagnosis? And here we can conceptualize that the patient has euvolemic hypernatremia. Euvolemic hypernatremia. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And so the best answer is the fact that she had such bad trauma That trauma caused her to probably have brain swelling. That brain swelling caused herniation, a disruption in posterior pituitary function, caused you to have less ADH centrally. That means less aquaporins in the distal collecting duct, which means that your intravascular space, the blood vessel space, is going to have now the inability to get free water, i.e. the patient has central diabetes insipidus. So please note that SIDH, the patient is hyponatremic. In diabetes insipidus, the patient is hypernatremic. Central diabetes insipidus is the best answer here. Hypernatremia, similar to hyponatremia, you always want to look at the physical exam and look at the volume status. Hypervolemic hypernatremia could be due to excess amounts of sodium chloride or even 3% hypertonic saline. 
Remember, these patients with hypervolemic hypernatremia due to hyperalimentation could also have a non-anion gap or non-anion gap, excuse me, high, um, non-anion gap metabolic acidosis due to hyperchloremia. My brain is working faster than uh, <laughs> that I'm able to talk. So remember that hypervolemic hypernatremia could also be due to not decreased aldosterone, but excess aldosterone. And remember, you're going to be bringing in a lot more sodium. Let me pause right here. What kind of acid-base abnormality would you have if a patient has hyperaldosteronism, a metabolic acidosis or alkalosis? What do you think? Go ahead and put that into the chat box. Wonderful. Yeah, you got it. It's going to be alkalosis. Good. Hypervolemic hypernatremia could also be due to Cushing's syndrome, where you are going to have a permissive effect of cortisol on aldosterone, bringing more sodium in. What are causes of hypovolemic hypernatremia? Well, again, this patient is going to be dehydrated on your physical exam. And if they're going to be dehydrated, they probably lost a lot of free water. And that loss of free water could be due to just dehydration. It could be due to such bad hyperglycemia that you have increased tubular filtration of glucose. And with that glucose going in the pee, water is following. So that's contributing to dehydration. It could also be due to the polyuric phase of acute tubular necrosis. As the tubules are going to regenerate, you are going to have a phase where the kidney is going to be confused for a little bit and is just going to be dumping free water as the tubules are re-epithelializing. Remember that ascites, the fluid is not going to be intravascularly. The fluid is going to be in the tummy. They're going to have a fluid wave, for example, on your uh, physical exam in your vignette. So in that situation, because you don't have free water in the intravascular space, you are technically going to have hypovolemic hypernatremia. And you can argue that you can say, ah, well, ascites could be hypervolemic hypernatremia because they may have uh, a, a volume overload state. But the point is, is that in ascites, it is all going to be extravascular and all in the uh, intra abdominal or peritoneal uh, compartment. And as we said, euvolemic hypernatremia is going to be due to ADH abnormalities. And we talked about central diabetes insipidus. Remember, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is where ADH is present. However, the kidney is unable to respond to that ADH. And no aquaporins means that you can't bring in free water. If you can't bring free water in, you're going to be hypernatremic. What's going to be your urine osmolarity in diabetes insipidus? Go ahead and type that in the chat. Urine osmolarity in diabetes insipidus. What do you think? I want to hear high or low. Good. Wonderful. Good, good, wonderful. Low urine osmolarity. All right. So remember that in the vignette, if patients are going to have hypo or hypernatremia over, for example, days to weeks, you want to correct the sodium abnormality slowly. So the way I think about management of sodium abnormalities is if it happened, if the uh, uh, hyper or hyponatremia happen very quickly, I can correct it quickly. If the hyper or hyponatremia happened over the course of days to weeks, I got to go slow. And why? Well, if I correct hyponatremia too quickly, i.e. I go low to high too quickly, I could get central pontine myelinysis, which basically presents as coma, upper motor neuron signs because you're damaging corticospinal tract and locked in syndrome where they're only able to communicate with their eyes due to uh, the pontine fibers being affected. If I go high to low too quickly, i.e. I correct hypernatremia too quickly, I can get cerebral edema. And the mnemonic is high to low, the brain will blow. So cerebral edema is manifested by headache as well as Cushing's triad, hypertension, bradycardia. Again, you'll see this in the vital signs in your vignette and then irregular respirations. Usually for many of these chronic sodium abnormalities, you don't wanna correct more than 0.5 MEQ per liter per hour, i.e. in a 24-hour uh, day, 
you don't want to go more than 12 MEQ per day. So you want to go very, very slowly as you're correcting these sodium abnormalities that are chronic. All right, that was a beast. We have just a little bit left. We're going to be just going through potassium and glucose, and then we are done. Are you guys ready to get this webinar over with? You guys doing okay? Go ahead and type in yes into the chat box. All right, I got some woohoos in the chat box. That pumps me up. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, guys, for your attention. Let's go ahead and go through the next section. Let's start with this question. A 30-year-old female is admitted to chemotherapy due to a new diagnosis of ALL. She was noted to have a 30% blast burden. Prednisone is begun for her initial chemotherapy regimen. Labs after her first dose of chemotherapy are notable for a potassium of 5.8, a creatinine of 2.2. Which of the following lab findings may also be seen in this patient? A, hypophosphatemia, B, hyperphosphatemia, C, hypercalcemia, D, hypouricemia, or E, hyperoxaluria. What do you think is the best answer here? Excellent. Very good. And if you're saying hyperphosphatemia due to tumor lysis syndrome, you're absolutely correct. Let's go ahead and do a little bit of a basic science integration. This patient had elevated amounts of blasts. Blasts are going to be the hallmark cell for acute leukemias. In particular, you have to know that the blast houses a lot of potassium a lot of FOS, and a lot of purine byproducts, which is uric acid. So the key here is for us to note that if you are going to have chemotherapy, it's going to burst these blasts. And that's the underlying pathophysiologic uh, component of tumor lysis syndrome. As a result, things such as potassium is going to then be released into the extracellular space or the intravascular space causing this finding known as peaked T waves. Remember that the high amount of FOS is going to be released. And when you're thinking about high amount of FOS released into the bloodstream, it can bind up your calcium. So your ionized calcium can go low. And remember, you need to give medications such as rasburicase and allopurinol to deal with the excessive amounts of uric acid that can be seen in tumor lysis syndrome. So hyperkalemia is going to be due to a few mechanisms, reduced excretion from the kidney, increased cellular burden, which we just talked about due to, for example, blast, as well as transcellular shift. And this is based on acidosis. When we think about reduced excretion, it's, oh, the kidney got messed up and go back to the concepts of BUN to creatinine ratio. Reduced excretion could also be due to chronic renal failure, as well as low renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Again, it goes back to the fact that aldosterone modulates sodium, pot potassium, and hydrogen ions. Hyperkalemia could be due to increased cellular burden. And this goes back to that basic step one principle that the cell is rich in potassium intracellularly. And so increased cellular burden could be due to uh, uh, RBCs that are going to be broken down, things such as rhabdomyolysis or polycythemia vera and tumor lysis syndrome, which we talked about. All of these pathologies basically tell you that there's a lot of cells that are bumping into each other or cells that are just rupturing and thus releasing potassium. And then transcellular shift. So what causes hyperkalemia? Alkalosis or acidosis? Go ahead and put that in the chat. What causes 
hyperkalemia, acidosis or alkalosis? Excellent. If you're saying acidosis, you are absolutely correct. So let's go ahead and think about the basic science correlate here. And here is your intracellular environment. Here's the extracellular environment. Remember that the intracellular environment is all going to have K. And if in acidosis, you can visualize with me that, oh, if you have acidosis, the extracellular fluid environment is going to have a lot of H's. And so the way I think about it is if somebody outside of my apartment put a lot of trash, i.e. acidosis, I'm going to bring that potato or I'm going to bring, excuse me, that H plus into my home, that trash I'm going to take from the extracellular space and I'm going to bring it intracellularly. But in order to maintain electrochemical neutrality, if I bring in H plus, I have to give out K plus. And so that's super important for us to know that acidosis is going to cause hyperkalemia. Now, there are going to be conditions such as exercise and cell lysis that can also contribute to hyperkalemia. And we talked about that in the last slide. The USMLE and shelf exams love for you to know the next best step in management related to hyperkalemia. So let's just review the pathophysiology related to hyperkalemia and then integrate the management points. Remember that at times you will have increased cellular burden. Either cells are just rupturing or there's increased production such as blasts or polycythemia vera or uh, uh, some sort of increased bone marrow state. In this situation, the cells bump into each other, they release potassium into the extracellular space and that potassium now in the intravascular space is going to cause cardiac myocyte action potential disruption. Remember that phase three of the cardiac action potential is all potassium mediated. Not only do you have cardiac myocyte action potential disruption at the cellular level, but on the EKG level, you're going to see peak T waves. So the treatment for hyperkalemia for step two, I think of this mnemonic, stabilize, shift, excrete. Let's say it out loud stabilize, shift, and excrete. Stabilize the cardiac membrane using calcium gluconate. Shift the potassium intracellularly using insulin and glucose. Beta agonists such as albuterol and sodium bicarbonate. Remember the transcellular shift, you're kind of uh, opposing that. And excrete, which is a little bit of a slower uh, therapy, but you want to excrete based on diuretics, k exalate and using hemodialysis. This is a very high fidelity way to think about next best step in management, reversing the underlying pathophysiology and hyperkalemia, stabilize, shift, and excrete. All right, we're gonna pivot a little bit and now talk about hypokalemia. Let's go ahead and go through this question. A 36-year-old female presents with proximal muscle weakness and headache. She was recently diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. She's on sildenafil. Vital signs is 158 over 88. A brewy in the abdomen is going to be heard. Labs show a low potassium, a high bicarb, a high creatinine. Do the BUN to creatinine ratio. And further testing in this patient would most likely reveal what? A, string of beads sign of the renal artery on CT angiography. B, atherosclerosis in the renal artery. C, microaneurysms and inflammation of the renal artery consistent with polyarthritis nodosa. Or D, C, ANCA positivity. What do you think is the best answer? Excellent. Wonderful. Well, this patient is probably going to have what diagnosis? Well, with pulmonary hypertension plus renovascular 
hypertension, you're going to be thinking about fibromuscular dysplasia, which gives you the string of beads sign of the renal artery on CT angiography. In particular, what you want to know is the fact that RAS is going to be very upregulated in this patient. And if RAS is going to be very upregulated in this patient, the patient is going to have a lot of H plus that is peeing out. If there's a lot of H plus getting peed out, you're going to have a presumed metabolic alkalosis. And remember that this patient may have a intrarenal AKI because the patient is having reduced glomerular perfusion, and that can be damaging the uh, kidney. Why is it not polyarthritis nodosa? Because polyarthritis nodosa can actually give you renal artery uh, hypertension or renal artery stenosis, excuse me. However, remember, polyarthritis nodosa rarely affects the lungs. So I say PAN, no lungs. PAN, no lungs. All right. Excellent job. The whole concept of hypokalemia is going to be tested primarily related to secondary hypertension. Anytime I see hypertension and hypokalemia, I say renin angiotensin aldosterone system is overactive. Hypertension and hypokalemia, I say RAS is going to be overactive. And what I look for in the history of the vignette is I say, whoa, they are on a lot of medications and the patient is still hypertensive. They have uh, treatment resistant hypertension. So then the USMLE will give you the renin to aldosterone ratio. And when you're thinking about the renin to aldosterone ratio, if you have a high renin and a high aldosterone, this is probably due to renovascular hypertension, which we covered in the last question, diuretic use, because you're having low intravascular volume, or a renin secreting tumor, say renal cell carcinoma, for example. If you have high aldosterone with low renin, think about the high aldosterone coming from a aldosterone secreting tumor, such as Kahn syndrome, and thus feedbacking and lowering your renin. And then if you have low renin and low aldosterone, but you still have hypertension and hypokalemia, you could be thinking about non-aldosterone causes such as congenital adrenal hyperplasia, uh, for example, Cushing syndrome, other things that you could uh, be uh, thinking of is like licorice ingestion, et cetera, something that is not going to be true RAS mediated. All right, the last section that we're gonna be going through is going to be related to hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. And what I wanna do is I wanna just stratify the extremes. Hypoglycemia, you're gonna be in a pro-sympathomimetic state in your vignette. Tremor, sweating, palpitations. What's a differential here? Hyperthyroidism is a nice differential. You could have CNS dysfunction such as confusion and seizures. Again, neurons need glucose. Hypoglycemia means that your neurons are gonna be dysfunctional. And then hyperglycemia is going to have the polys, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia. Because of the excess amount of osmolarity going to your brain, you could have headache. And remember that the excess glucose load in the kidney can cause you to pull water and you can have dehydration. So remember that when you have polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia on your shelf or step two, Anytime you recognize that in the history, you're going to say the word diabetes. And in particular, what you're going to do is you're going to say, okay, if it's a sodium problem, i.e. a high sodium problem, then it's going to be diabetes insipidus. If it's going to be a high glucose problem, it's going to be diabetes mellitus. And so now you can stratify further that diabetes insipidus is either going to be central or nephrogenic and diabetes mellitus is going to be type one with the presentation of DKA or type two. Another way to think about hyperglycemia is going to be stratifying these two pathologies that shows up on shelf in step two CK, diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar hyperglycemia. Both of them have high amount of glucose as the presentation. Both of them are gonna have polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia there are some subtle nuances. In, type, in diabetic ketoacidosis, it's usually due to type 1 diabetes, 
on history, they may even have too small breathing. They may have acidosis more, high ketones, and an elevated anion gap due to beta hydroxybutyrate elevations. They're going to have more acidosis, metabolic acidosis. So they're going to have a low bicarb and their glucose levels are going to be anywhere between 250 to 500. You're going to contrast that with the patient who has hyperosmolar hyperglycemia. In this situation, the patient is going to be more predisposed to type two diabetes where insulin is there. It's just not responding. They're going to have just a mild acidosis and mild ketones. And this could be primarily due to dehydration and their glucose levels are much more elevated, greater than 600. Insulin is going to be the treatment for both of them and increased fluids, i.e. in the form of normal saline boluses, for example, is going to be the mainstay of treatment for hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end. Let's go ahead and take a deep breath. I hope you all learned a lot from this session. I just ask for a couple of minutes just as we summarize. Today, we went through a bunch of serum lab values in a very systematic approach, integrating many vignettes. We talked about liver, gallbladder, and we broke down the RFP based on the extremes. I wanna thank you all so much for attending and engaging with me today. Please be on the lookout for my step two CK course. I do have a test taking strategies course that is good for both step one and step two CK on my website. One ask that I have from the bottom of my heart is if you don't mind Googling high guru trust pilot, and maybe I can just put the uh, link right here for you. But if you don't mind just leaving a review, how you liked this session, please, it only takes two minutes, but it would just help me help other students get the word of Hi Guru. It's an up and coming resource and I'm just trying to impact students one student at a time. If you love today's session, tag me on Instagram, find me on Reddit, uh, make sure that you subscribe to my YouTube channel. It would mean a lot to me if you can just spread the word of Hi Guru and this session in particular. I just wanna say, if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, take them now. And before you leave, type one thing you learned from today's session, and I uh, would love to see you in future sessions. Take care and thank you so much.